Hi, my name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist for the Xerces Society and the project coordinator for the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas Project. Thanks in advance for watching our training webinars. Please note that these webinars were recorded live and included question and answers from the audience. We've edited some of those answers and questions to make this a little bit more straightforward for those of you watching after the fact. Whether you're watching these for the first time or trying to get a refresher, we hope they'll help you learn how to participate in the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas and why it's important. If you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with us via email at bumblebees at xerces.org, or you can find more information on our website. Thanks again for watching. Enjoy the webinar. All right, so we've laid the ground rules. Um, thank you so much again for being here. I'm now going to let the other panelists or the other voices that you may be hearing throughout the course of the day um, introduce themselves, and, um, and then we'll get started. So we're going to start from the east and move towards the west. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Lamke and I also work for the Xerces Society. I am a bumblebee conservation specialist and I coordinate the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. So I'm located a little bit of ways from you guys, but I'll be here helping to answer questions about bumblebees or the project in general. And other than that, I'll just be on mute. Yes, <clears throat> sorry about that. My name is Joel Sauter. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. I'm a diversity biologist out of the Lewiston office. I'm responsible for coordinating this atlas across Idaho, uh, whether if the, the Lewiston part, but also across the whole state from the southern end to the northern end. So if you have any Idaho specific questions or need support over the coming months, um, as you get involved in this, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Ann Potter here from Olympia, Washington, and I'm a biologist that works for the state of Washington, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, where I specialize in working on insect conservation. I'm super excited about the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas project and the opportunity that it gives us to learn about bumblebees in our region, both as individuals in this very intimate manner as individuals and then also as participants collectively as we bring all of our data together. So it's great to be with you all today. And now back to Rich. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, uh, so those are the folks that will be answering your questions uh, as we move through the workshop today. Um, they'll be typing in answers and saving some sort of um, answers that we can discuss in between modules as well. Um, I already saw a question pop up about um, the shelter in place orders and COVID-19. Um, and I think we'll cover this a, a number of times today, but it's obviously very unfortunate that we're here um, in these circumstances. We were supposed to be holding a bunch of in-person events throughout the Pacific Northwest this spring. Um, we did, we were able to hold one in Idaho and one in um, Oregon before um, the restrictions went into place. But we're obviously now in a, um, in a, in a situation where um, it's not ideal. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's very clear that your personal health Community health um, is the most important thing right now. And you need to be listening to your state and local officials. You need to pay attention to your healthcare professionals. Um, you need to be listening to yourself. Um, those are the most important drivers right now. Um, and bumblebee surveys can come second. Um, we have, there's, there's time in front of us. If we need to, we could push surveys to next year or the year after or the year after that. We're not in a rush. Um, there's no reason to jeopardize community or personal health for any survey reasons. Um, so please pay attention to, um, to the regulations in your area and please follow them. There's no reason to push boundaries for bumblebee surveys. It's not essential work at this point. So please, please stay safe. Um, 
The other thing that I would, would say about that is, you know, in the beginning of uh, the communications that we've been putting out this year have largely been focusing on trying to get people outside of their backyard areas to go do surveys in remote areas, those high priority grid cells that are on our map that we'll show you later. Um, you know, that's our ideal and, and we're hoping we'll get there. We hope that states will begin to open up and travel will again be allowed and we can encourage people to go out in, into those remote areas. Um, but it, that also might not happen. And if it doesn't happen or if that doesn't work for you, because you're afraid to travel and you don't want to go stay in a hotel or a campground, that is totally fine and you can focus closer to home and do surveys closer to home. Um, whatever makes the most sense for you. So I will just say all of that up front and I really want you all to know that we value your personal health more than any data that you could potentially collect for us. Um, so, so please, you know, please do keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, keep your community safe. Um, thank you for your interest and thank you for being here today. It's incredibly important and valuable. I'm so excited that so many people are here. Um, but moving forward, let's, let's stay safe. Um, okay, without any further ado, I'm going to dive into the content. Um, because this is an incredibly long presentation, we've got four hours slated here. Um, one of the things that I'm going to do throughout the course of this is throw out some polls to make it a little bit more interactive. So I'm going to start by just throwing a poll out there. Um, and this is going to be just a bunch of questions that will hopefully pop up for you on your screen um, while I'm giving a little bit of an introduction here um, that you can answer some of these questions and give us sort of real time feedback about um, you know, there'll be some questions about what you see on the slide or some more general questions um, out there. So, so first thing I'm going to do based on our, um, uh, this is I'm going to throw out this question about COVID-19 since we're already talking about it, um, which says, you know, given the current, or you can go ahead and read it and I'll, I'll just begin to do my introduction. Um, so go ahead and answer those questions. Uh, I'm going to launch the polling right now. Um, so there are, um, I'd like to do the thank yous up front because this is such a long um, presentation. So I, I'm going to be talking for most of the day. And, um, you know, obviously I couldn't be here without Ann and Joel's support. So the, the, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife are incredibly important um, partners in this project. And I couldn't do it without their help. On top of that, here in Oregon, I have partners, which is the Oregon Bee Project, um, which is a collaboration between the Oregon Department of Agriculture and Oregon State University. Um, and we have a diverse set of funding through a lot of different funders, including the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service, the BLM, and then some um, private foundation support. Um, I also want to put a, a special thank you out to Washington State University Extension, specifically the Western Washington Urban IPM and Pesticide Safety Education Program. Um, they are, they were supposed to be hosting these workshops for us um, in Western Washington this spring, um, but unfortunately we do not have um, we were not able to do those in-person events, but they were still nice enough to support us and, um, and help us put this webinar on. So a real special thanks to WSU Extension and the Western Washington Urban IPM and Pesticide Safety Education Program. So thank you um, so much. All right, so I see the answers here. Um, a variety of, of um, opinions about how people feel. It looks like people are starting to feel comfortable, which is, is really nice to see. And then people are only here from Idaho or in Washington, which is interesting. Oh, there's one or a few others out there, um, but interesting to see the distribution. So thank you. So we'll use that polling as we move through. Um, we, here's the, I'll show you the results. Um, we'll use those as we move throughout the day today um, to sort of make this as, as interactive as we possibly can. Um, and um, please, um, Joel, Ann, and, and Katie, if I'm doing something that doesn't, that, that doesn't make sense or 
um, is, 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 is confusing, please just chime in and let me know because I can't see what other people are seeing. It's a strange environment. So please chime in if, if there's any need to do that. Okay, let's move on. So we're gonna to start today with an introduction to um, the Bumblebee Atlas project and why we're here. Um, a lot of people have asked me sort of why do we need a, 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 why do we need a training workshop or, or why do we need a Bumblebee Atlas project? Um, so let's dive in and talk about that. Um, before I do that, just a quick introduction to the Xerces Society. Um, we are a nonprofit organization based in Portland, Oregon. We have offices throughout the country in, in close to 15 states, and we're up to around 60 staff working for us. We have a bunch of different um, programs, including a native pollinator program, and that, that program is largely focused of uh, trying to put habitat on, uh, on the ground on, on the agricultural lands. Um, Katie and I both work for the Endangered Species Program, and our role is to assess the extinction risk um, of any invertebrate, um, and then to advocate and do science and research to protect those animals. Um, we also have an aquatic invertebrate program, um, a butterfly conservation program, and then a pesticide program that searches, that serves as the overarching sort of umbrella for those, um, those other programs. Um, we are a member supported organization. Um, so if you appreciate the work that we do, please do consider becoming a member. Um, you, can, you can find the options there to do that um, on our website at xerces.org slash donate. And please do consider becoming a member or rejoining if you've been a member in the past. Um, so the outline for today looks like this. We're going to give an introduction. Um, uh, then we're going to talk about bumblebee conservation and ecology. And then um, I'm going to show you a couple of videos that will talk about participation in the atlas. So how do you participate in the atlas from doing a, a field survey? And I've gone out this spring and I've filmed myself doing a survey. And I will share that video with you so that you can watch it and actually get some field experience and see what that looks like. Um, and hopefully you'll get a chance to maybe get out and practice while you do that. Um, and then I also recorded a video that will show how to submit all of your data. Um, so, so those should be really helpful. Um, and then we'll talk about um, a few more details about how to participate in the Atlas. And then we'll finish with a, an in-depth look at how to identify bumblebees in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so all in all, it should be around four hours. Um, it may end up being a little bit less than that. Um, if it is, that's great. If not, um, um, we'll go, we'll go till four and, and potentially depending on how long the bumblebee identification piece takes, um, we may go a little bit past four. We'll, we'll see how it all ends up going and how many questions come in, um, and, and all of those things. So, um, why do we need a bumblebee atlas project? Um, which is, a, which is a good question. Um, bumblebees are, are widely dis distributed. There's, there's lots of different species out there. Um, and so, so why do we need this Atlas project? Um, maybe a more simple question to start with is, is why are we protecting invertebrates? Um, a lot of people ask me um, when I tell them that I work in animal conservation and that I focus on invertebrates, they ask why I'm spending time conserving, you know, the small, slimy, stingy things um, in their lives. And that is a, um, I suppose, a bit of a challenge for, for some people to get past that barrier. But no matter how we look at it, um, invertebrates make up over 90% of the animal biodiversity on the planet. And that is number of individuals, number of species, weight. It doesn't matter how we look at biodiversity. Um, it, insects or invertebrates come out on top. They are vastly more numerous than any other group of animals on the planet. Or, um, or really vastly more numerous than any other organism on the planet. Um, in addition to just their biodiversity though, they are incredibly important for ecosystem function. They are decomposing our plants and returning nutrients to the soil. Um, they're conducting biocontrol in our gardens and reducing the need for chemical inputs. And they're also the base of the food chain. They're directly feeding all kinds of animals from fish to songbirds to other mammals. Um, but mostly related to what we're going to be talking about today, they also are responsible for pollination. And pollination is 
basically the, the allows plants to reproduce and create seeds and fruits that feed a lot of the planet. And it is that role in pollination that makes um, bees uh, and other pollinators what we call keystone species. And a keystone species is an animal that contributes more to the environment than we might expect that um, just by their size or their abundance alone. So just, just sort of seeing a bunch of insects flying around, you might not recognize that they're incredibly important at, at helping 85% of the flowering plants um, to reproduce. Um, so we wouldn't have the flowering diversity on the planet without the, the pollinator diversity that we have. For those of you that don't remember um, your, your basic biology, um, uh, poll pollination is basically plant sex. Um, it's a, a bee or another animal moves the male parts of a flower, the pollen, to the female parts of the flower, to the pistil or the stigma. <clears throat> and that allows the plant to set seed and, and make a fruit if, if that's what the plant does. So, so uh, it, it's essentially allowing the plant to reproduce and to, um, to continue its population and build its population. And most plants, around 85% of them, need an animal or some vector to move their pollen from the male to the female part of the flower. And as humans, we care about this process because of the food that we eat. This is what a standard Whole Foods de uh, produce department looks like on a standard Saturday or Sunday, um, at least pre-COVID. <laughs> um, and this is what it looks like if we take bees out of the equation. Um, so we about one out of three bites of food that we put into our bodies is from a plant that was pollinated by a bee. So we wouldn't lose all of our, our food. Um, there would certainly still be some citrus fruit, fruits and some lettuce and asparagus and rhubarb and other things like that. Um, but a lot of our most delicious and nutritious fruits and vegetables like our apples and onions and avocados uh, and, and our berries do disappear if we take bees out of the equation. In addition to feeding us, Bees are also, and, and pollinators, other pollinators are also feeding a majority of the planet. Everything from songbirds to grizzly bears, the majority of their diet is fruits, nuts, seeds, roots, um, and other plant material that would not exist without pollinators. So it's not just humans that are dependent on pollinators for their food, it is also these, a, a lot of animal diversity on the planet is dependent on pollinators as well. There are six main groups of insect pollinators, butterflies, flies, moths, wasps, beetles, and then in the lower right here, bees. And of these six, bees are really the most important pollinators out there. And the reason for that is that they eat young, or they eat young, they eat pollen and they feed their young pollen. So, that is their only source of protein. So bees are out in the landscape intentionally collecting pollen and intentionally putting it all over their bodies. And then they want to bring that pollen back to their nest and they actually form balls of pollen in their nests and lay their eggs directly on their pollen, and sometimes, sometimes mixed with nectar. And that is their larval only, that is their only food source for their larvae when they're developing before they become adults. So bees are really the only one of those six insect pollinator groups that are intentionally moving pollen through the landscape. The other ones like butterflies and, and moths and wasps, they are flower visitors, but when they go to a flower, they're only there for the nectar. And they might happen to pick up some pollen while they're there, but they're not intentionally collecting it and moving through the landscape like a bee. In addition to that, bees exhibit something that we call flower constancy. And flower constancy is the notion that, that since all flowers are structured differently, they, uh, it's, it's hard to extract pollen from them in specific ways. Um, they're, they're, they're just structured differently and bees have to learn how to extract pollen from every species of flower that they visit. So once a bee finds a species of flower that it gets really good at extracting pollen from, it, it visits that same species of flower again and again and again. 
And if you are a plant that's trying to reproduce, you want your pollen to go to the female parts of a flower of the same species. If it goes to a separate species, it, that pollen of a different species could actually clog the stigma and prevent your ability to reproduce. So flowers are really looking for their pollen to move between the same species instead of between different species. And bees are much more likely to do that. If you're an animal that's just looking for nectar, um, you know, you, you'll go to any old plant. Um, but this, this specificity of flowers and how difficult it is to extract pollen makes bees um, really um, exhibit that flower constancy. It's not 100%, um, but it is pretty consistent or more so than the other animals. All right, here comes another poll at you. I'm just curious about your pollinator education. Um, how many bees uh, are native to North America and how many of those native bees make honey? Here's the poll. Give you guys a few seconds to answer the poll here. Have a highly educated group, which is good for the most part. All right, it's about 30 seconds. Got most of the votes in there. About 220 of you have voted. Um, so, yeah, most of you um, were able to come up with the, 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 right, the right answers here. So we have around 3,600 species of native bees in North America. Um, and actually none of them um, make, um, none of them make measurable amounts of honey that none of the native bees do. Um, and I realize now that I didn't put that answer in there. Um, but, but those of you that answered one were probably most collect because honeybees are here. Um, and they, they do make honey, but unfortunately they're not native. Um, so that's uh, just a little piece of uh, information for you there. And we're gonna move on here and I'm gonna share some of the information about these native bees. Um, so honeybees, when most people think about bees, they do think about honeybees. And this is a problem for a number of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is, is that honeybees are just so vastly different from our native bees. Um, I just mentioned that none of our native bees make honey, um, but most people, when they think about bees, the first thing that comes to mind is honey. Um, and, and the other thing is, is that most of our native bees are really just single moms living in a hole in the ground somewhere by themselves, trying to feed their young. Um, they don't live in huge colonies, they don't have workers, they don't have queens. It's usually just a single female bee living in a hole somewhere trying to get enough pollen to lay eggs on. Um, and that's, that's really different for a number of reasons, but, but one of the major ones from a conservation perspective is they're living in the ground. So if you kill a single bee, it's that single, it's that entire life cycle of that bee disappears. Whereas with a, with a honeybee, if a honeybee loses a few members of their hive, it's going to have some impact on their reproductive ability, but it's not going to completely destroy them. Um, and so, when we look about risk, when we think about risk assessment and other things as related to bees, if we focus only on honeybees, the issues are vastly different than they would be with the majority of our other um, our other species of bees or our native bees. And we do have tremendous diversity of native bees in North America. Um, so there's around 20,000 species worldwide. In North America, including Mexico, there are uh, around 5,200 species. And in the United States and Canada, there are around 3,600 species. And here you can just see a few pictures of the different shapes and sizes uh, of those bees. Um, they're truly beautiful animals. Um, and the reality of this is you have a backyard, you have a safari in your backyard. Most of these animals are back there, but a lot of people have just really never taken the time to look at, at those animals. Despite all of this, or um, in addition to all of this, 
most of our or a lot of our native bees and other insects are experiencing dramatic declines. Over the last several years, there have been several papers that have come out that have research studies that have looked at insect declines. And we're seeing huge drops in, in insect biomass as well as in biodiversity. And this is incredibly um, concerning. And if we look at the causes of those, the majority, the biggest driver for habitat or for the, the declines that we're seeing in insects is habitat loss. And here at the Xerce Society, we get a tremendous number of questions about how to create habitat to improve the situation for bumblebees, or not just for bumblebees, but for pollinators and other invertebrates. Um, and what at Xerces, what we want to do is we want to use evidence to figure out what the best habitat is so that we can get habitat in the ground and functional for all animals. We don't just um, want to give some recommendations that will maybe help. We want to provide the best help that we possibly can. And the concern here is that if we just throw a bunch of flowers in the ground to save the bees, then we may only be making the common bees more common. We may, may not be providing the habitat needed for some of our rare species or, or some of our species that are in decline um, to, to rebound. So we need to do more research to figure out what plant material and what other habitat considerations are incredibly important for these animals so that we can get that habitat in the ground, make management recommendations, and um, allow some of these rare species to recover from the declines that they've already experienced. Um, so we need more evidence to do this. And the start of that are baseline data sets. We are just lacking baseline data sets for invertebrates pretty much across the board. But in order to assess changes in populations or changes in species composition or to see changes in phenology, um, we can't do that if we don't have a baseline amount of information. We can't assess if populations are changing if we don't know what populations are right now. Um, and I have a picture on this slide of Dr. Robin Thorpe, who um, is, is really a, a, a wonderful biologist and a wonderful scientist who passed away last year. Um, but he was uh, a professor emeritus at UC Davis. And he studied bees for his entire career and, and contributed you know, way more than, than just the ways I'm about to describe, but an incredible man to say the least. Um, but one of the things that he did that was so important for bumblebee conservation is he had long-term survey sites in Northern California and Southern Oregon. And he, because he had those long-term survey sites, he had baseline data. And then over the course of a couple of years, during the course of his study, two bumblebee species started to disappear from his survey areas. And he sort of raised the red flag and said, you know, there, there's, there's some bumblebee conservation issues going on that we need to work on and do a better job of. So he's sort of the, the grandfather of bumblebee conservation in North America and set a great example for the type of baseline data sets that we need to be creating. Um, as you all likely know, there are declines that we're seeing in, in honeybees as well. So we've been seeing average winter losses as well as average summer losses for the last 12 years. And despite the fact that this is, um, you know, we're not as concerned or you don't see the news stories about colony collapse disorder, the declines we're seeing have not lessened um, at all. And we're seeing the data that we have, uh, of the baseline data that we do have, suggests that the same thing is going on with a lot of our native bees. Um, but these are our insurance policy uh, against the case um, of the honeybee disappearing or becoming less abundant. If the honeybee happens to disappear because of the problem that that managed species is having, we're going to need a huge biodiversity of our native bees to conduct those pollination services on farms um, and in, um, in, in wildflower fields. Um, it is not honeybees that are out in, um, this is just north of Mount St. Helens, um, and honeybees are not out there um, pollinating those wildflowers. That is done purely by native bees and some other insect pollinators. Um, honeybees are not important wildflower um, or, or native area pollinators in North America.
Um, so we need our native bees. Um, but what we do know about our native bees suggests that around, um, a, or at least about bumblebees, suggests around a quarter of them are facing some degree of extinction risk. Um, and four of them are critically endangered, two of them are endangered, five of them are vulnerable, and one of them is near threatened. And this is a, some analysis that I did along with a bunch of other scientists. And these, uh, these red list assessments are published on the IUCN red list website. Um, so you can find those at IUCN um, or, or red list, IUCN red list.org. You can go there to check out some of the assessments if you're interested in, in the data that we do have. And so here in the West, in, in Oregon, Washington, and, and Idaho, we came up with a list of eight species that were in decline or facing some degree of extinction risk. Um, and three of those species, the one that are in bold, the ones that are in bold on this slide that you see here, um, Bombus stucklii, Bombus morrisoni, and Bombus occidentalis, all three of those species were adopted by the states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho as what we call species of greatest conservation need. Um, so every state has to come up with a wildlife action plan um, as mandated by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And on that wildlife action plan, they list species that are of significant conservation concern. Um, so, so all of Idaho, Washington, and Oregon have listed those three species as SGCNs, or Species of Greatest Conservation Need. And that makes conservation dollars available for the kind of research that we're doing right now. And these are the target species for the surveys that we're conducting across the three state area. We're, of course, interested in all bumblebees but especially interested in the habitat associations of these three species so that we can do a better job of helping them to recover. The causes of decline for bumblebees are, there's no smoking gun. We, it's a straw that broke the camel's back kind of scenario. So we've been throwing all kinds of issues at them and we'll go through these in more detail um, when we um, talk about the conservation and ecology section, which is in module two. Um, coming up here in a little bit. Um, so one of the major issues there is um, on top of all of these sort of larger structural issues going on, here in the Pacific Northwest, our baseline data sets largely map um, population densities. So if you look at this map that you see here, this is a map of the Pacific Northwest, and all of the blue dots um, that you see on the map our observation since 2000 and the gray background um, dots that you see there are historic data that existed before 2000. And you can see that the historic data does a little bit better job of covering the, the entire state. But the recent data that we have since 2000, it pretty much just follows our transportation corridors. It's pretty easy to find I-5 on that map. You can follow the dots north and south there. It's pretty easy to find Ashland and Eugene um, and Salem and Portland and, and Olympia and Seattle. Um, and you can find Boise and Bend um, and Spokane. All of those urban areas show up really well on these maps, um, basically mimicking population density. But I can assure you that bumblebee populations and bumblebee abundance do not mimic human population density. There are tons of bees out on the landscape for which we just have never collected or we haven't gone out there to look. Um, so that's why we're, one of the reasons that we're doing this project is to fill in a lot of those gaps to find out, well, maybe some of these species under, are in decline are thriving out there where we haven't looked yet. And we won't know until we go out there and conduct those surveys. So to sum it all up, um, we know that, that bumblebees are essential pollinators. We know that baseline data sets are essential for monitoring change in populations. We know that some North American bumblebees are imperiled and some Western species um, as well. Clear distribution information is lacking and in many cases it's based on human population density. And we're also, because we don't have distribution information, we also don't have the necessary habitat associations for particular species. Um, and so without those things, it's really hard to conserve animals. Um, so what we're trying to do is do a better job of, of learning this information so we can improve things moving forward. 
So that's the reason that we've launched a, a Bumblebee Atlas project. And the reason that we have decided to use community science to address this is because we know that it also works. So what you see here on this map is, or on this slide, um, this is in the middle here is a map that was published by Sydney Cameron in 2011. She got a, a fairly sizable scientific grant to do a professional survey for a bunch of bumblebee bees across the Western United States. And there they had a team of four to six people that traveled throughout the entire Western United States looking for the Western bumblebee. And everywhere that you see a yellow circle on that map is somewhere where her team looked for bumblebees. The places with orange slices here, those are the places where they actually found the Western bumblebee. Um, so they were able to locate it some in Southern Oregon here, um, in Nevada, and, and up and down the Rockies. But it was pretty undetected throughout most of Oregon and most of Washington. The map here on the right, every red dot that you see there, those are our, our observations of the Western bumblebee that were submitted by community scientists. So they, our community scientists spread out in the landscape with cameras, were able to find the Western bumblebee up and down the West Coast here, as well as throughout the Intermountain West in areas that these professional scientists were not. And I'm not trying to one for, for one second say that this is a bad study or they didn't do a good job. I'm just saying it's incredibly hard to tackle the Western states of North America using six or four, you know, four to six people. If we can train thousands of people to be out in the landscape collecting observations, we can cover the ground much more quickly and get a really clear, um, really clear distribution information for our bumblebees. Um, so to use community science, what we've done is we've taken the three state area, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and we've divided it up into equal area grid cells. The grid cells that you see there are approximately 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers. Um, and we are encouraging folks like yourselves to go out and survey, you know, follow a standardized protocol and you'll learn more about what that protocol is later and conduct surveys in these areas. Um, and then we can actually have systematic surveys that are spread out across the landscape. We can gather those baseline data information that we need, as well as the habitat associations, associations that we need for all of these species. Um, so that's sort of our goal. Um, this is the survey protocol. I'm, I'm, we're gonna go over it in much more detail later. So I'm gonna mostly just skip over this slide and move on to um, some of the um, results that we've seen so far in the Atlas, just as a snapshot for how things are going. Um, so in, we started this project in 2018. This is the third, we're entering the third year of the project. Um, and we've had really broad engagement so far. In our first year, we had 325 volunteers adopt a grid cell, and we had 200 volunteers um, attend a training in person. Um, we also trained a bunch more people um, online and in a webinar like this um, as well. So we've had lots of people use our online resources. And we've gotten great feedback from our volunteers, and most of our volunteers um, are coming back um, for a second and third field season. So, so hopefully if you're not new, um, if you're um, perhaps you're coming back for a refresher or, or you're, um, you know, hopefully you're coming back for the third year, you'll keep doing this as well. Because I think most people that get involved have wanted to stay involved. The other thing that we've learned is these trainings seem to be effective. Um, so the blue line that you see here are surveyors that have attended a workshop. And what we found is that surveyors that have attended a workshop have done a better job identifying their bumblebees than people that didn't attend a workshop. Um, so this seems to be an effective way to communicate and teach people how to, um, to identify bumblebees, which helps us do our job better as well. Um, in 2019, we continued to have an incredibly broad engagement. We've now had over 600 people adopt a grid cell. We, we, we saw over 330 people um, in 2019 alone. So we've now, conduct, we've now trained more than 600 people throughout the Pacific Northwest about bumblebee conservation. 
Um, we, we collected a lot of observations in 2018. We saw um, 5,800 observations come in of 21 different species. Um, those distributions differed across the state, or, or so this is the list of species at the bottom here, and the colors represent um, the different states. So you can see Bombus bifarius is, is quite common in all three states, um, but Bombus bazasenskii is um, over here on the right, is common in Oregon and Washington, but it's largely absent from Idaho. Um, it's just most of the uh, coastal species that exist you know, in the Cascades and westward. Um, similarly, in 2019, we had a lot more people participating, so we upped our um, bumblebee observations by around 50%. We got 8,500 records in 2019, and three new species were observed in the Atlas project in 2019 as well, Bombus curvialis and Bombus frigidus, both which were seen up here um, on the uh, British Columbia border. And then Bombus impatiens, which is actually a non-native species. Um, it's native east of the Rockies, but we had an observation of that species here in central Washington. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, again, the distribution differed by state. Um, we had a huge jump in Bombus bifarius uh, observations in, in 2019, as well as in Bombus bazasenskii, so almost 2,000 bifarius records um, in 2019 alone. So all in all, we've, we've captured around 14,300 bumblebee records of 24 different species. Um, the, the surveys we've conducted throughout the region um, have shown high abundance in some areas and relatively low abundance in others. Um, one interesting observation is all of the red dots that you see on this map here are negative survey data. So it's where someone went out and conducted a survey and detected zero bumblebees. Um, and this is interesting because uh, uh, this information doesn't show up on the maps that I showed you earlier. Um, we have to, as conservation scientists, infer absences when we don't see observations of a species on a map. But when we've had someone go out and actually conduct a survey and then submit those survey data, we know that there are no bumblebees there, which is incredibly important information to have. A zero data is just as important as reporting 100 bumblebees. Um, it's certainly not as fun to conduct a survey like that, um, but it is, it is equally, if not more important, to, to have those information. We've also gathered over 300 observations of our SGCN bumblebees, um, in, including many records of Bombus occidentalis and Bombus morrisoni, which you can see here on the map. Um, and um, unfortunately, we've still not detected Bombus sucleae, and we'll learn more about that species later. Um, so if we breeze through this, you can take a look at the historic Bombus morrisoni occupancy of the Pacific Northwest by ecoregion. You can see it used to be quite common, sort of east of the Rockies and down through the Snake River Plain. Um, but what we've learned in the Pacific Northwest bumblebee atlas is that species seems to continue to be in decline. It's still um, existing throughout the Snake River Plain, but it's disappeared for most of Washington and its relative abundance has dropped um, in, the, um, in the areas where it was once quite common. Um, and interestingly enough, this is where it's now most currently common, and it's most common in the East Cascades. So it's existing in this more wild area, and it's disappeared from some of our agricultural areas. Um, so these are the areas where it's seen significant declines, um, and the Blue Mountains is the only area that we've seen a little bit of an increase um, of that species. Similarly with Bombus occidentalis, this is its historic record here. It used to be broadly distributed and quite common um, in the darkest areas on this map. One out of five bumblebees observed used to be um, Bombus occidentalis. Its current relative abundance is um, you know, almost zero throughout most of the landscape. The only place that it gets you know, even remotely close to where it once was is in the Northern Rockies and in the Cascades. Um, so this is where it's currently most common. Um, so different scale, you'll notice in the, in the um, legend there that the scales are quite different. This is using the, um, the scale here on the right. So it's most common in the Cascades where it was historically most common in the coast range and other areas of the Pacific Northwest. So we've seen really significant declines in this species um, across the range. 
Um, so the red here is all the most significant declines in the Columbia Plateau and Blue Mountains, as well as up and down the coast. Um, Bombasuclei used to be quite common um, throughout much of the region, and it's gone. <laughs> um, it's an easy one to show you. It's really unfortunate, but the species seems to have completely disappeared from the Pacific Northwest, or at least we haven't detected it yet. So one of the things that you may have noticed by looking at all those maps, we've done a tremendous job of covering a lot of the states and conducting surveys. But there are a lot of areas that we've still not covered yet. And every area that you see on the, uh, this map that you're looking at right now that is gray or white, um, those, have not, those grid cells have not yet been adequately surveyed. Um, so part of the reason that we're doing this workshop today and we'll continue to, to reach out um, to, to all of you is to share this map um, and to encourage you to go out and to conduct surveys in these areas to adopt one of these white grid cells and to get out there. So especially if you live in one of these white grid cells right now, it would be fantastic if you could adopt one of them and conduct some surveys this summer. Again, for those of you that might have joined us since the beginning, um, I talked in the beginning, but we really want to make sure that, that everybody's staying safe and following local regulations about travel and everything. So please, please um, stay safe out there, pay attention to your own personal health, and do the best that you can. Um, we're hoping that things will open up come June, but, um, but to only do what you and your community thinks is the right thing to do. Um, so please go out and plan your bumblebee watching uh, adventure.